Okay, so welcome back to Yogi's on the Road, and I am in a different studio with Alexis and Trisha Donegan. Hey, guys. Hi. So, uh, well, Trisha, we just came from your uh, high yoga class. It was pretty amazing. And uh, I met you for the first time last week, but you've known Alexis uh, for a little bit longer. I feel like it's my whole life, though. Yeah, (laughs) cool. Or maybe many other lives. Oh, dear. Already. We're getting into that already. (laughs) Already. Boom. (laughs) So, um, yeah, we have you here because, I mean, uh, first of all, the two times that I've seen you, I think you're an amazing character, super strong, you're super motivated, and there is so many stuff. And so many stories that you have that are really inspiring. And I think it would be nice to like share some of your stories or some of your life, you know, with our listeners and yeah, see if we can help or inspire anyone. Uh, so let's see how, it how goes. did we get here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> how did I get above H Street is the first question. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be something like this. I yeah. think that everybody here is a yogi and that, um, When people practice yoga, they get superpowers. Um, That's in the book, the Yoga Sutras. And something that attracted me to Trisha was her superpower of clarity and memory because she remembered me from one time many years ago. That was one example. And also that um, we've established that Giuseppe has a superpower of charm that can get people above 8th Street. <laughs> I also have... Uh... <laughs> really good hair. It's in the oh, hair. Yeah, it's in the hair. Guys have both have and I also hair. fall asleep really easily. I've, oh, I've, yeah, that is this I've developed that with the Ashtanga practice. It's mm-hmm. one of my talents. You can put yourself to sleep? Oh, pff, I than... can do it right now on air. <laughs> hmm. Narcolepsasana. <laughs> yeah, I love Go. that. So, uh, Trisha, where do you come from originally? Um, from Detroit. Um, I always say I always lead from Detroit because um, I do feel like it is, for lack of a better word, one of the most soulful places to be from. Um, but I'm from a suburb outside of Detroit, okay. about 45 minutes away. Cool. So, um, I mean, obviously, you know, you, how to say it, like, um, you know, you have your yoga studio now and all that, but that sort of comes a little bit later. What happens in the earlier part of your life you know how was it growing up there uh, in Detroit and I mean you told us a little bit uh, some stories about your past that I find really interesting Um, so yeah why don't we go like chronologically and start like way back when yeah Um, so yeah I mean um, I am the middle kid out of three Um, my older sister still is here my younger brother is not Um, And we grew up, like I said, I mentioned in a suburb outside of Detroit and living there our entire childhood lives really never really went to Detroit. Um, We would, quote, lock the doors, do all that stuff um, that um, perhaps you have heard about. And we didn't know even that when I was little, I was being racist by just locking the doors as we drove our our station wagon, you know, down there. And we would never lock our doors like that before in the suburb. And so um, I have to actually just lead with that, that um, it is so... But it was like a gated community, you mean? You know, there wasn't the white picket fence, but that's what, that's, you know, if you want to talk about it, that's kind of what it was. Mm -hmm. And... um, and my parents did their best, even though my dad went to school during the race riots in Detroit. My mother was also raised there. Um, they tried to protect us. And I do feel like I protection, no matter where it's from, even if it's from love, it really does shut down and close things down. Yeah. Um, and so saying that, um, I was raised to... Um, with a strong resource and protection behind me, but how much of freedom did that give me, actually, Mm -hmm. um, to be able to explore my own self and my own being. Um, What was it like to kind of have that conditioning growing up, not only from your parents, but also from the culture, you know, like the Midwestern culture? And I'm not going to say we didn't know any different, um, but you kind of do what you know. Uh Um, I went to a school um, and, you know, a high school that had, you know, we were all very much looked like me. We were white. Uh Um, We had a we had a good Asian population because my parents worked very hard to get me into this public school. Um, 
I believe we probably had a couple of African American students in there, but those were because their parent, their dad was a basketball player, or it was very, very stereotypical. Mm -hmm. um, when I moved around, I used to say like we were the. Um, if you've ever heard of nine hundred two one zero, I'm going to really age myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were the Walshes. Um, my parents worked super hard um, to get us to that status so we could go to that to that school. Yeah. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know that my mother would sneak to the house next to us to be the seamstress for the, for them. Um, I didn't know my father had four part time jobs, including his other job. They never told us this. Um, we never saw that struggle. Um, and perhaps now I wish that. We would have a more of an understanding of that, um, not because at one point my father's like, you never knew that we were impoverished. Yeah. And I don't know how I would be feel differently if there was a conversation in my house, a real conversation right. about what was happening and, and what the priorities of where we needed to be to get what we wanted. Yeah. Um, and I went to a very good, very good high school and um, – chose to play soccer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so all of those efforts, whether the outcome is what um, my parents intended, um, I always felt um, loved and protected, but not necessarily felt like I fit in. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was part of what you're saying, Alexis, of the culture. It, it just didn't make sense to me, but I didn't know how to articulate it, how to understand it. Or even perhaps stand up for right. the racism that was institutionalized right. in my own family. Yeah. And I would never, ever say I was a racist. Right. I mean, it's so normal you don't even realize that it's, you know, that it's happening. It's completely unconscious. And I think that when I think about yogis, that um, where we are born and where we incarnate, it like sets us up for our life work. And, you know, what I'm... What I'm guessing is that, you know, being shown so much um, rigidity and different gates, you know, closed offness in in your childhood, it might have set you up for being more open and inclusive now. That's that's the story I'm going to say. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, stories and we were talking earlier, like to be honest and it's like honesty is such a. It's difficult. It's a difficult word because – or a difficult thing to grasp because my story about the same incident will change the older I get or the wiser yeah. I get. And so it's like, oh, was I lying to myself? Was I not – was I was I um, just being ignorant about the, about yeah. the institutionalized racism, sexism, right. all of the things that that I believe that my parents were trying to protect me from right. but really became – uh, ignorant about right. and um, and not able to necessarily relate to the rest of the world and and we're really in this world together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean, parents. I mean, I feel most of the time they have the best intentions to sort of like shelter you and make sure you grow up and they protect you. But then, I don't know. I feel like with my parents too. Sometimes. Um, they sort of forget that, you know, once you have a child, it's like that child is their own human being and with its own path and everything. And, you know, they can give you advices and things, but then you got to live your own life and explore and get out of your comfort zone or whatever pre-boxed life they think when they sort of like, you know, raise you. Yeah, I mean, times change, things shift. Um, just like, you know, I remember when I came out to my parents, um, I sat them all down. I had a big, <laughs> big family meeting. I even used the big L word, lesbian. I didn't walk around it or talk or talk around it. And it wasn't about a girlfriend. It was about me wanting to open up my life to them. And um, my parents were immediately... I'll say my mother was immediately upset because simply let, because she didn't think I could ha leave a happy life that way. When yeah. was that holder you? It was pretty late in my um, years, even though I had figured it out a little bit earlier. It was around college. I see. And I was glad that I took some time to do it because it, it enabled me to have some compassion for my mother, for my father, for my sister. My brother was still yeah. there at that time, even though I felt it was so... 
anti-gay. Yeah, so stifling. And and I remember because I had taken a moment to do it and really worked on myself, and it took me a while to figure out who I was. And so I knew that it would not it would take them a while. And even though my mother was upset and asked me if I wanted to change my body parts and asked me if because she had this knowledge from Oprah Winfrey show. Um, <laughs> And my dad reacted a lot differently. And so that was the first time that I strongly, strongly felt compassion for people who were not giving me a chance to be me. And that changed the game for me. Yeah, that's that's really wow. intense. I mean, the way that you describe your sexuality, it's almost like a spiritual practice for you. You know, start to like exercise loving kindness towards people people that might see you as the other or the or the enemy or something like that and so confrontational to like face a shadow you know you you forced these people to face shadows which which forces me also to um you know i um about my quote expectations of people um you know whether you call it power or control i definitely wanted my parents to say something different. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's that would perhaps be part of my control. Yeah. And about controlling what people and um and really that was um that brought me compassion and to the point where I have to um I have to practice daily that everyone is doing their best. Yeah. Everyone is doing their best. And there's some people you're going to choose to be more around while they're working on their process because of choice or not choice. And some people that you won't surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more that I've found we're all a little bit more like each other than we're not. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That seems like a simple thing, like sentence. <laughs> but it's so not, profound. Not but simple. Also, yeah, and also just Where like we talking are. about the gay thing. I mean, I remember when my parents first went to their first P flag meeting, parents and friends of lesbians and gays, P flag, and they had seen um, someone from my high school, even though this was, was older, and they're like, I can't believe we saw the Rosenbergs. How embarrassing. And I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, you're yeah. both there. It's not your thing. It's, it's, you think you made us, you know? And so, and I was like, huh, the Rosen, Rosen, Rosenbergs. Um, no, it happens to, you know, and so just basically the P flag, that's, you know, and I'm not that old, but that was what, 30 years ago. Yeah. So we do keep adding on. It's simple. So it used to be P flag, and then it was, and now it's LGBTQ, and now it's LGBTQIA. <laughs> and so, we just keep adding on, and eventually, the the you know the the the, the um, what would you call it the um, what would you call it? the acronym acronyms I don't know, the yeah word. the acronym the word is just going to have every single person at on star there. ohm sign <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean like True. so it's like um, it is simple um, what was it like like realizing that you were gay as a minor and being in a world of like straight only. You know, it sounds like it was more than just straight only. It's like white only. It was like you can only be a certain socioeconomic status or else, you know, your I guess your parents carried that shame. But how was it to kind of hold that secret or discover that secret? Well, I think as it? a minor, we we were in that economic status no matter what. Uh -huh. Um even yeah. though I was the Walshes, yeah. we all drove more expensive cars than our teachers at our high school. Mm -hmm. Our parking lot was closer to the door than our teachers parking lot. <laughs> um, so the power dynamic, just that, um, the status right. yeah, that yeah. we had, even though we didn't like even know about it, yeah. um, was interesting. But I think the question that you're at, like for me to answer that question, it, it um, I was, I didn't know I was necessarily gay um, for a while. I learned before that um like when I was very little, and I can't remember the age, but it was below 10, um, probably six or seven or eight. Every time I blew out a dandelion for my biggest wish, I wished that I had a penis. Mm. And it wasn't because I thought someone made a mistake with my body. It was more that I couldn't get what I wanted without one. And even that young as a minor. And I wasn't even talking about, I didn't know about 
jobs and mm. and that kind of thing. I was like, I just wanted to play with the boys because the boys got to play sports and where the girls yeah. didn't. And so all my friends yeah. became boys. And so when the boys had sleepover parties and my mom's like, you can't go, I was like, I just wish I had a penis. Yeah. I just yeah. wish I could do what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so that was that was a tricky because I didn't necessarily – have that as orientation right yeah. it just was a lack of quote power yeah, yeah. Community, um community and then even. yeah what's that community I think. because i ex- yeah because i was a little bit isolated from the community that i wanted, wanted to be, be with, with. <laughs> um Yeah, and little so I, did you know then the U.S. women uh, soccer team then became world champions. Exactly. <laughs> Years yes, later. going back. Yes. <laughs> um, so, and I, and I really, um, and I always felt good when I moved my body in sports and, and things like that. Um, I felt like things were in, in the right places. Um, Uh, it's when I had to sit and be still where um, I felt that lack of freedom mm. and my head would get very busy um, and I wouldn't know what to do with, quote, my energy or my yeah. thoughts because um, I didn't know who to talk to about them or or um, right. who to share with or who to ask questions to or who to be curious with. Um, I wasn't – I was played sports. I wasn't doing yoga and yoga to – is um, – Is it about curiosity about yourself? Yeah. Um, oh, that's so true. Wow. And, and yeah. rather than try to get involved with other things to figure yourself out. So uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't been introduced to yoga. Mm-hmm. It was more sports um, before then. You were in soccer, yeah. I played soccer like it was my job. Okay. Um, it got you to college? Got me to college. Um, And that was amazing. Um, I landed in um, University of Dayton in Ohio, um, D1 school. And um, the biggest difference coming from my area, all of a sudden I was at a private college Catholic school that um, I had not a lot of experience with Catholicism or that community. Uh, let's say that. Shout out to all <clears throat> Catholic schoolgirl lesbians, <laughs> all of my, yeah. my old homies that <laughs> went to Catholic high school and everyone was like came out gay or trans except me. I was like, huh, I'm the only one in my group that didn't end up this way. But hey, guys. So wait, what, what did you, what, where did you go? Because I went to the, uh, the opposite one. <laughs> what? Oh, you went to the one where, where I was the oh, only, you're the only one. Only. Oh, um, I went to the wow, your guys sorry are like sisters. Oh my God. We were so gay. Yeah, it would have been – I guess it, it was really fun for them to be there. You know, we got this, we got skirts. We got match. We got uniforms. I don't know if you had those, but <laughs> they were cool because you didn't ever have to wash them. Um, yeah. I do love a good uniform. I do love just to like <laughs> – I do. I do. I don't, I don't like to think about anything about <laughs> clothes, like about – Yeah, like, I know, right? That's, that was great. You don't have to think about it. I like to put my, my uniform on and go. Right. Cool. Yes. Yes. Well, you should do that for the yoga studio as well, you know, so I can pick up uniforms and all sweat right? in them. That would be sweet. Like rip away pants? Yeah. Oh, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, my, the last time I had a uniform um, – And we can get into this later. Was when I owned, when I opened up the restaurants and owned the restaurants. And um, oh yeah, we let's did, talk um, about that. We did overall um, railroad uniform. Like the, nice. that was the, that was the uniform. Um, yeah, the restaurant story was they, really appealing. You know. And then they told me I wear a, had to wear a hairnet, and so I yeah. shaved my head. I took care <laughs> of that. But anyways, easy. <laughs> well, you went to you went to college, and that you know, even though it was college, it was restrictive. It um it was a I would say a private Catholic yeah. college yeah. um and I got in there obviously for playing soccer mm-hmm. and did not go there that was the main reason the objective I went there yeah. um so it was not only culture shock um in my experience I also think that perhaps um a lot of the a lot of the students came from previous catholic places where or catholic institutions and then when they finally got to college they just went nuts yeah. nuts and i was like oh what's <laughs> happening here um and so that was i would say um 
probably one of the most ch- four challenging years of my life yeah. um, being in college. Um, I felt like it was my duty. I felt like it was – I did not have a choice. I felt like I was – that I did not have a choice to mm-hmm. – um, and I had to be out even though um, it was not welcomed. Um, out sexually? Yes, out sexually. Um, with As being a lesbian, it was not welcomed. It was not um, – and that more and more, I felt like I had no choice and I had to step up. And I created um, a group along with their bylines because I had to do it with their bylines. So it had to be a support group rather <laughs> than a gay group because okay. we needed support. So this was like almost the beginning of you kind of um, – ac- your activism in the context of the like corrupt social systems. I be- it was probably like officially – like officially yeah. my first stance, my first um, me putting yeah. my body um, at risk physically, uh-huh. um, my heart, my brain. Yeah, your um, reputation, I mean, um, socially. Uh, it gave me um, – It. I really felt taking a risk and it, it yeah. not necessarily working in the moment. Um you know, I had um, – I probably picked four of the only uh, roommates that would have me, mm-hmm. and none of them were gay. I was the only openly gay person. Um, they put themselves at risk because we had the meetings at my apartment because even though I did it all by bylines, um, the college kept saying, no, 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 you can't have this group, yeah. even though I did it how they wanted me to. Um so we got threatened a lot, our house, our everything. Um, so they – I did meet some people who – who risked it also yeah. to um, for this? Um, How beautiful! I mean, you know, as as challenging as these traumatic experiences are, they set us up to, you know, you were set up to have a life of immense strength and fortitude to overcome that adversity. And you know, I would say that that's a part of yoga practice, actually, like real yoga, more than just postures, in a sense. I think this is a really like important piece of your life to to be in this the really challenging dark place. You know, it's it's the sh- the the shadow. The shadow is just as honest as the light. You know, the difficulty is just as honest as the easy parts. Yeah, and it's um, and when the and sometimes we, the stronger we get or the smoother we get with our tools, um. Things don't necessarily get easier. We get stronger, and then, mm-hmm. um, and then the things that you might not want to get easier um, start to tend to get easier. Like um, the loss of my brother. The more and more I became connected to myself and this planet, and what I could still do through him or for me. Um, uh, I've lost my thought. Um, when did he die? He died six months into me opening up the yoga studio in the Lower East Side. Um, it really starts to – it made me really think about um, how we act and what we what we do go through yeah. um, on this planet. And I often think of – I remember I was running in Japan and I remember just crying and uh, and going, wow, I'm grateful – um, I would, if someone told me I, to raise a hundred million dollars to get my brother back, I would do it in a second. Not a problem. Hmm. But when I was running and crying in Japan, I was so, I was so raw and could only feel gratefulness for him that he is, what he had did on this planet, and I had never thought I could think that way. Um, and it was almost now I feel like he knew that he was going to go because. Every minute of that guy's life, he made it better for other people. Um, what was your brother like? What's his name? And what was his relationship like with you, like in Dayton? Uh, Brian Miller Donegan um, was, I would say, one of. Um, I was stuck in the middle. Um, my I had an older sister who is Kareen, who is incredibly awesome, and a younger brother, Brian. But Kareem just happened to play with Barbies and Brian happened to play with soccer balls. So that's where that went. Um, 
And so me and my brother got really tight. And um, not only do we look alike, do we dress alike, Mm -hmm. do we have the same? We kind of felt like we were alike. And and he is one of the very few people besides... um, Besides another person I have in my life, um, Tamara, the other woman who is um, our kid, other mother, Lula, that I felt um, so connected with without even words. Yeah, um, say, sounds like a soulmate. <laughs> soul, yeah, and so, um, and I do, um, I do, I do believe now that my brother had some kind of knowledge that his life will be shorter, so that he had to do more in it. And he really did. Um, he would come visit me at, at Dayton, you know, at, co- at college. But when uh, basically when I was opening up my studio and the time was crunched um, and I was going to open up like I think it was, a you know, a Thursday. And I was supposed to open up on Monday or something. I knew exactly who to call. And um, he got on a plane and he came in and he helped me finish up the studio. And um, that's who he was. No matter what, he would he would pick up the phone and say yes, and that's the nice. kind of that's the kind of dude he was. Um, Amazing. Yeah, that's... it's very hard to just say yes to to anything. Yeah, yeah. So, Brian Miller Donegan, rest in peace. Um, as um, you have made everything more peaceful here and now. Yeah, shout out to Brian. Um, he definitely helped you. He's helped you through a lot, and I'm sure that he still informs your behavior, you know, as a kind of, like, I don't know, role model or something. He does. It's it's a nice word. I like that. Informs my behavior. Um, Because influence is such a... Influencers now, right? (laughs) Uh Um, So I really like that. Um, The the knowledge that he's given me to keep going and moving through. Um, yeah, you know, Giuseppe was pretty interested in your, um, like, restaurant career, and, you know, kind of like how Brian seems, was, like, super down for whatever, DFW as I use, um, <laughs> he, you know, you, you fucking kicked some ass with some restaurants, and, uh, I think that that's an important piece to discuss about your, um, path. And I guess I'm, you know, I'm curious how you got from uh, Catholic schoolgirl college to um, to killing it in Atlanta. Um, I basically, when I graduated college, um, most of the people that um, I grew up with um, from high school, they all went to University of Michigan. I went to University of Dayton, like I said. And then a lot of them moved to New York. Um, and I chose to move to Atlanta. I wanted to... Um, moved to a place that was gay. Um, it was supposed to be the up-and-coming, most feminist um, city, big-time city. Um, I wanted to be somewhere warm. Um, and so I picked Atlanta, and I just picked it, and I went by myself because um, my goal was really to do those things, and I really wanted to buy a piece of property, mm-hmm. and I really wanted to um, create my own my own thing, and I wasn't quite sure what that was. And I, I knew... I didn't think I could do it in New York, and I didn't think I could do it with the comfort of my, quote, squad or the people I'd already grown up with. I needed to go a different way. You chose challenge. New York was on your radar, but New York was too much at that point. I don't know if it was too much. I think maybe perhaps I would say that, but I also just feel like um, I wanted to – I very much love the comfort and the support of my team, my squad that I had been with. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was time for me, like, again, like whether I think I have no choice or I've been chosen to, to go a different way and then, and, um, like develop on your own to create something rather than squad went to the city, the squad, the team, they all went to New York city and I, I came to Atlanta. Um, and, um, Atlanta was, Atlanta was awesome. Um, 
Gotta love heat. I love heat. I don't, I, here's the thing. I don't trust anyone who doesn't believe in heat and hugs. If you, oh, can't, yeah. if you can't hug it out, you know, that's that, that's kind of my two I things. liked when you said that today in class. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> shout out. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, there were times that I would be practicing hot yoga, and the teacher would be like, well, you know, it's 105 degrees in here, but it's 115 outside. <laughs> right, right. We should just go out there, but you would get first-degree burns on your feet if we practiced outside. And I was like... Yeah. Yeah, and I grew up in Sicily. My mother hates AC, so <laughs> rock and roll all summer long. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no, we never had AC until we all went away to college. And I was like, what's up with that? Um, <laughs> we grew up with no AC at all. But, um, and I, st- I still, that's funny. Like, a lot of my students are like, when I tell them I do not have AC in my apartment, they're like, oh, you're just hot all the time. Yeah. It's that's good. the way to go. It's like a, a life's choice. It's like yoga, you know, and no AC. They're sort of like parallel. But uh, <laughs> so what I find interesting about the restaurant story uh, is that it's sort of, um, I don't know, maybe it's like one of the first times that you sort of like created this like strong community or you did something for the people around you that were maybe in a difficult spot or that you started like helping the people with like less possibilities or you started doing something social social for others when i when i first yeah when i first moved to atlanta um i started um a business called um lunch in and it was just me and a lunch bag and a and a you know and a wheelbarrow basically behind me and that's when we had pagers hello everyone um count out yeah for pagers Pagers. (laughs) (laughs) and um pound signs but um and um, I created um, called Lunch In, Biz- Lunch In. And so I went to Atlanta, and Atlanta was all about, like, food, art, and, like, hair salons, basically. That was the biggest crux of it. That's what, like, everything was going on in Atlanta. And so I was like, huh, well, these people, these entrepreneurs, and they, they just stay in their shops. They're art galleries. They're hair salons. They don't have a staff. They, don't, they can't get away. They're just there trying to do their own thing. And I'm like, I'll bring food to them. Um, this was before Seamless, before there was delivery, before like you, you know, either you have made your lunch in the morning and you try to find it in a fridge or not. Um, and so I started, um, I started doing that and, um, I just, I made seven, seven sandwiches. I wrapped them up before people were doing wrap sandwiches and I put anything that would make you feel good in a wrap. Like I put a turkey pot pie in a wrap and I would wrap it up with mashed potatoes. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, I'd have Sodom and Gomorrah with, um, chicken and chicken and, uh, you know, Caesar dressing all wrapped up. Like it was the first time I wrap, like anyone was wrapping it up. And um, I went around the city and I just, you know, I went to all these places and day one, I was too busy for myself because accidentally when I went to the hair salons, you know, thinking I was going to provide the entrepreneur with the food because th- th- he or she couldn't leave, what I didn't really count on or notice was like, you know, either the woman or the man in that chair for eight hours getting their hair done and processed. And I'm like, who has time to sit here for eight hours? I'm like, oh, you need my lunch. And then all of a sudden I was connected to people like Ted Turner, Mindspring, Coca-Cola, because they were sitting in that chair all day long and they ate my lunch. (laughs) That was in a, you know, in a, in a, a brown bag that I'd stamped myself and made up the names myself and, and made the, the sandwiches myself. And I was doing it all illegally because um, why'd you name them it was called lunch in so i had why'd like you name the sandwiches so the first like I, 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 I think the, <laughs> there was the howling coyote yes. there was the sodom and gomorrah there was the bull which was like basically like hot f- chicken fingers like wrapped up with like blue cheese and a wrap there was witch's spell for the vegetarians yes. yeah. um there was oh what was the beef one those are genius what the coca-cola people eat uh <laughs> What did they, they and then there was like one? the the special of the day, you oh know. My gosh. And that's where everything like went in from yesterday, you know, and just like <laughs> that's how it usually just, works in every ex- restaurant. Exa- yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the Coca Cola people definitely versus the Mind Spring people versus the you know Ted uh-huh. Turner, you know. Um, I'm going to tell you, everyone eats about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> they all eat the chips and the apple with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
say the apple. But I was just trying to, you know, um, and so by like literally day three, I was too busy for myself because I'd met these corporate people and I was just trying mm-hmm. to, I was just trying to do the entrepreneurs. Um, but then it turned into corporate lunch catering okay. and that had not existed. And so, um, and that really took off and it, it just, it took off, it took off and took off. And I was like, oh, well, I can do this a, a different way. And I was, I was like, I'm just going to, and I, I got so tired running around the city, um, you know, yeah. in my, in my car, my lunch boxes and all that. And I only had a small window for lunch. And so I didn't feel like I could service how I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And so then that's when, um, the lunch in restaurant became restaurants um, in the lower in uh, actually in the Lower East Side of Atlanta. <laughs> so that's just I, I, just, I go low and east apparently. <laughs> um, and uh, that is when you know I was trying to figure out what to do while I was like paying um, all these different restaurants and places their their fire inspection so I could use their fridge. I had four fridges in my house. I had you know and I was like, wow, this is amazing. But I got to figure out how to sustain this. And um, at that point, President Clinton, Bill Clinton, um, was passing out seven entrepreneurial grants for young entrepreneurs that were trying to empower places well, rather than gentrify them. And so I wrote up a business plan um, saying that this is what I wanted to do. And I, you know, I wanted to move into East Atlanta. I'd buy a house and I'd be in the neighborhood and um, I want to build restaurants. And not only do I want to build restaurants, but I want to because uh, it was the neighborhood was being displaced, um, it was being gentrified completely. And I had bought my house from two men who had redone the house uh, on the corner. And um, I bought it with money in my pocket. And um, and I really wanted to be in it and immerse myself in it rather than. Um, be someone from Bloomfield right. Hills outside of Detroit and uh, come in and More just community. come in with an idea. And so that's when um, I wrote Clinton. I said, this is what I want to do. And people laughed when they saw the um, my proposal. Trisha, how did you how did you come to a, a proposal that, um, you know, it it decelerated gentrification? How did you kind of create this? I think, you know. It was, you know, when I first went into the hair salons, you know, I was going in there and and I saw the same types of people in the chairs uh-huh. yeah, and I yeah. saw the same, yeah. type, you know, oh, and I was yeah, just like, it. and I was like, huh, Doing like the delivery and I hear in Chelsea and here I am. And um, and so I was just like, there's got to be a better way. I make this food. It's organic. It's homemade. I, I put so much love in it and it's not spreading. Yeah. To everybody, yeah. Not necessarily quote the people I wanted, but just to everybody, and um, so that's when I was like, so I started just writing. I'm like, this is what I want. I want not only everyone to have healthy, organic, vegetarian food if they want, um, good meats, um, but I wanted them to have a, a place to live. I've always had a nice place to live, yeah. Whether it's picketed, fenced or not, right. I've always had a space to live, um, and so my. My wish was that in this neighborhood that was being gentrified where I bought a house in, that um, on the corner I got broken into every every weekend. My lawnmower would go away every weekend. Um, that it could be di- done differently. And what happens, I'm, I'm a, um, you know, is that even though the people in this neighborhood um, own their houses because they had been there for so long before I had been there, once the neighborhood starts to be gentrified, the taxes just rise and yeah. the people even own their houses they can't afford it anymore or they can't afford to bring their houses up to the standard of the um, the new community. Yeah. And so my, my dream was like, let's do this a different way. Let's um, build a restaurant and I will, with President Clinton's um, money and grant, I will hire everyone in the um, – and create an empowerment zone rather than gentrified. And um, not only hire them in the restaurants, so we had to work with each other, train each other how to mm-hmm. work with each other rather than just survive or protect ourselves. Because right. um, a lot of the um, neighborhood people had never worked with each other because there was not a lot of trust. Right. Um, so hired them, hired all of us in the neighborhood that were there. We all got hired. Um, 
some of the some of the people who cannot afford the houses anymore for the taxes, we built co-ops. So not only did we quote move them, they we moved them into a nicer space, um, places that they that were nicer because they most of the most of the neighborhood was older and they couldn't take mm. care of the houses anymore. Um, so we got good jobs. We got we moved them into new places. So not they were quote displaced into a better place. Yeah, and that felt awesome and it worked. And nice. And then um, and so we basically quote um, you know redlined the restaurant and redlined the apartments. You know half the apartment half the people paid for the other people, and that's how I built the restaurant and the menu. Um, we built it's called Heaping Bowl and Brew. Um, hi Todd Simaru and Izzy. Um, Izzy was the woman who we bought a truck for and she went to her, her garden and she brought back all this organic, um, fresh fruits, vegetables, everything she would drive, you know, to, to bring it back to the restaurant. And, um, so not only, so we created this, this menu that you could get fat off of for five bucks and you could come in and the neighborhood could come in and they could get a healthy uh, you know, whether it was vegetarian or not, we had everything for everybody. And it's just a heaping bowl. And because I feel everything feels better in a bowl when yeah. you mm-hmm. perhaps don't have as much. Yeah. So um, it's uh, heat, hogs, and a bowl. <laughs> 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 Bowls and spoons. Get rid of your forks, people. Get rid of the forks. <laughs> um, but, um, and so it, it, and it worked. And so not only did we um, give people jobs in that neighborhood, um, they, they were sustainable jobs. They got into the jobs. There was advancements, but they had apartments that they owned, yeah. and that um, and that the neighborhood was empowered actually. And so, um, two other real estate developers got wind of it because it was a real estate developers when they get tax breaks. Right. It all works for everybody. Yeah. And so we built three other restaurants wow. um, in the city that way. And I would say that was probably. I could say this a lot of times, I think, in my life. That was probably the most challenging. Um, but it was one of the most rewarding um, things I've ever done, really, to get down into it and get, get my fingertips in the, you know, turkey burgers and my toes in the grease trap and all of us working with each other, handing handing a knife to each other behind yeah. the, the, um, the kitchen so we could use it in a way that it would be effective for us all. That's one thing that I love. I mean, it's like being an entrepreneur doesn't mean that you have to build money off of other people's lives. So you building a business doesn't mean um, taking advantage of people, but business and like helping people can work together, you know. I'm a terrible opportunist, if that makes sense. Like, <laughs> I'm terrible at that. I'm terrible at marketing myself. I'm terrible yeah. at sniffing out that, quote, advantage, what you talked about. Or maybe I'm really good at not doing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a clear example that, you know, you can do something for people and still, you know, have it, to, you know, have it being successful. And sort of everybody can profit. And, you know, the whole area changed and... The whole area changed, and it's still changed, and um, and it continues to uh, that business that model that you know I think that President Clinton just kind of laughed at and was like, "Let's yeah. see what this kid can do." And then um, it was like, "Oh!" <laughs> and then we and then we did it. Um, so sort of like you, Giuseppe. Like I would not take a day off until President Clinton came and made me do it. So I've not <laughs> gone above H Street in a very long time. <laughs> so it's um, it's very special people that get you to do very special things, Ooh. whether it's power or or not um but i just i i kind of just did what what i wanted to do um like i said like obviously i feel like i've been raised very in a lucky situation Mm -hmm. and so i have everything that i quote need and there's a lot of people who don't and so i just wanted to um give them what i want that's not the what magic. I, not yeah. what I already have, or the hand me downs, or what I, or what extra I have, or ten percent of this, or ten percent of that. Right. It's always ten percent, one percent, or half an inch. I'm not quite sure where all these things come around, but that's we always <laughs> say those measures. things. Yes, exactly. <laughs> cool. um, so, and during the restaurant time, then you discover yoga, in a way. I did discover yoga in a way. Um, like I mentioned, I had been physical my entire life. Um, and it was, let's go back to the hair. It was from Wayne Bronner. Um, he introduced me to, um, you know, I was sitting in his chair for a long time. Um, and um, he was, 
this huge tattooed guy from Atlanta, Georgia with a Confederate flag like somewhere in, you know, and I was just like, what is going on? Stereotypical yogi. And, um, <laughs> and he's like, you come, come do this with me. And I was like, what? And he didn't tell me anything about it. I'd never, like I'd done yoga a little bit in college and I showed up like at his, his place with a big sweatsuit on, like mm-hmm. all the clothes that I would wear, like to go play soccer outside. Um, not hydrated, not, not prepared at all. And, um, and we went and it was probably, it, it was absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't just get away with doing the physical part. Um, it was more about just than physicality. Totally. The mind. Yeah. And so I was like, damn it. So let's, uh, yeah. yeah. What were you saying, Alexis? I was going to say, I think Wayne needs that letter that you keep talking about. (laughs) Cool. Wayne gets letters. Awesome. Yeah. So let's take like maybe a couple minutes break and then uh, we start the new episode with uh, the whole yoga and see what happens. Let's see. Oh my God, this story. It's like, it's like I'm listening to you and I'm also like watching your whole like, you know, (laughs) series. Who's sweating? I'm not sweating. (laughs) I am totally sweating. (laughs) I want to keep on sweating. (laughs) Awesome. Thanks, guys. See you in a few. All right. Thanks.